RPAR or RPAR is a single fund solution for an all weather portfolio strategy based on risk parity. One ETF to be fully diversified across multiple assets. I review it here. To discuss the RPAR ETF, we first have to talk about the concept of an all weather portfolio. As the name suggests, this phrase describes a portfolio designed to perform well during any market environment. We know that diversification lowers portfolio volatility and risk by using assets that move at different times times relative to one another. An all-weather approach sort of takes this to the extreme across different asset classes to smooth out the ride as much as possible. As such, it often sacrifices some return in doing so, but this is usually acceptable for the risk-averse investor or retiree who wants an all-weather portfolio. In fairness too, historically this idea has not had to sacrifice much performance to drastically lower the portfolio's risk. The most famous example of this concept is Ray Dalio's famous all-weather portfolio, which I've got a video on here. It uses a mix of stocks, treasury bonds, commodities, and gold. To do so, it uses at least five different funds. Enter RPAR, or RPAR, a relatively new fund of funds from Evoke Eris. Alex Shahidi is a co-founder. He wrote about the strategy's underpinnings in a book called Balanced Asset Allocation, How to Profit in Any Economic Climate. Basically, this ETF is a single investable fund that holds multiple funds across different asset classes to arrive at an all-weather strategy. Strategy. In their words, the fund seeks to generate positive returns during periods of economic growth, preserve capital during periods of economic contraction, and preserve real rates of return during periods of heightened inflation. To do that, RPAR holds global stocks, U.S. Treasury bonds, commodities, and tips in risk parity allocations and rebalances quarterly. Their reasoning for each asset class is as follows. Global equities for a strong economy and falling inflation. Commodities for rising inflation. Within those, commodity producers for a strong economy and physical gold for a weak economy, tips for a weak economy and rising inflation, and treasuries for a weak economy and falling inflation, known as deflation. Again, RPAR is purposefully agnostic toward the prevailing economic environment and diversifies accordingly across a risk parity weighted collection of different asset classes. The fund uses broad indexes for those asset classes and diversifies globally within stocks, which I'm a fan of. The fund even aims to maximize tax efficiency by minimizing income and distributions, so this fund wouldn't be terrible for a taxable environment as well. Similar to SWAN, RPAR aims to protect investors during severe market downturns but still allow for participation in up markets. Here's what RPAR looks like. 35% long treasury bonds, 35% long tips, 25% global stocks, 15% commodity producers, 10% gold, and negative 20% cash as leverage. RPAR seeks to track the Advanced Research Risk Parity Index, a proprietary index created by Eris and e QM indexes. This ETF launched in late 2019 and has an expense ratio of 0.50%. Assets may stray fairly quickly from their intended allocations, so the fund is rebalanced quarterly. RPAR utilizes a modest leverage of 120% via treasury futures, similar to how NTSX uses them to provide slightly enhanced exposure in a way that's still tax efficient. The true all-weather fund at Bridgewater does something similar. In October 2021, Toroso filed for a new riskier ETF, UPAR or UPAR, which launched in January 2022. It seeks to track the proprietary Advanced Research Ultra Risk Parity Index, also known as the UPAR Index. UPAR is essentially the same thing as RPAR, but cranks the leverage up to about 168%. Its target allocations are as follows. 49% long treasury bonds, 49% long tips, 35% global stocks, 21% commodity producers, and 14% gold. UPAR has an expense ratio of 0.65%. Apropos of its ticker name, RPAR uses risk parity as the weighting scheme for its components. This just means each asset is weighted in such a way that they all contribute the same amount of risk for which volatility is the proxy used to the portfolio. For a simplistic example, the historical volatility of U.S. stocks is about 15%. For long U.S. Treasury bonds, it's about 10%. Thus, risk parity is achieved at a 40-60 allocation of stocks to long treasuries, where each asset is contributing contributing the same 6% volatility. One doesn't need to know anything about risk parity to know that a 40-60 portfolio is considered to be pretty conservative. The theory is that the diversification benefit of holding multiple uncorrelated assets, think higher risk adjusted return as measured by Sharpe, is probably maximized somewhere around risk parity weights. This is the case because we can only offset the movement of a high volatility asset with a low volatility asset if we have a higher allocation to the low volatility asset. 
asset. Hopefully that makes sense intuitively once you think about it. I'll provide a couple more examples to drive this point home in a second. Interestingly, this idea of maximizing risk-adjusted return around risk parity weights actually is the case historically for stocks and intermediate treasury bonds. The greatest risk-adjusted return is achieved historically by a 30-70 allocation, which is roughly risk parity for those two assets. That happens to be the asset allocation for the Larry Swedrow portfolio. Another key underlying assumption is that asset class returns depend largely on the macroeconomic environment, which is usually unpredictable. In this sense, an all-weather strategy helps mitigate the impact of black swan events like the 2008 crash and 2020 pandemic as well. However, note that one can still utilize an all-weather strategy without using risk parity and vice versa. While we don't want to overfit and try to predict the future, I would argue the risk parity calculation at least offers a place to start the conversation of how one might allocate different assets depending on the goal. Now let's look at the historical performance of RPAR. Again, this fund is very new. Here's a very short back test using the live fund from January 2020 through August 2023 with 6040 global stocks and long treasuries as a benchmark and SWAN and NTSX also thrown in for a fun comparison. While we get to see the behavior during the March 2020 crash, a few years is just noise. 10 years is probably still just noise, but that's about how far I was able to go back using the constituent funds that comprise RPAR, along with the classic 6040 and a simulated proxy for NTSX. Notice how RPAR hasn't really delivered on its promise during these time periods and RPAR had the lowest risk adjusted return of all the portfolios. I'll talk about why shortly. Again, RPAR is agnostic toward economic environment and market behavior and uses a risk parity scheme to diversify across various asset classes. And there's the rub. In my opinion, it leans too far into fear-based allocations for market environments that are almost certainly less likely than others. Granted, it uses a modest amount of leverage to counteract that, but I think it still sacrifices too much space for one of the formulaic risk parity weighting to assets with low or zero expected returns for the sake of protecting the downside. That is, it inherently focuses too much on the downside and not enough on the upside, and we're investing in the market precisely because we expect it to go up more than it goes down. This is like buying an umbrella every day during the summer just in case it rains that day. A better analogy about strategies like this is from the famous hedge fundy who said, it's not so smart to stock up on winter coats when you live in Miami. Put another way, the premium you're paying for that insurance policy is likely just dragging down your long-term total return. A major crash happens about every seven years on average. While it certainly feels better psychologically to weather the storm when it hits for the investor checking their portfolio often, we don't want to stifle the growth happening in the six years leading up to that storm. Now don't get me wrong, all this market agnostic risk parity stuff is fine for the risk averse investor or retiree aiming to minimize volatility and the potential for material loss. It's also fine if the assets you're using with it have similar positive expected returns. But it is almost certainly a bad idea for the young investor in an accumulation phase with a medium to high risk tolerance. And in fairness, it looks like RPAR wasn't really built for the latter audience. This is how hedge funds invest, but most people do not need to and should not want to invest like a hedge fund. Moreover, I still think there are better, cheaper ways to go about achieving its intended goal. More on that in a sec. First, let's talk about specific assets. Global stocks across all geographies and cap sizes sound great to me. Unfortunately, they only get about 25% of the fund. I like the choice of long treasuries, and I'm even okay with their allocation of about 35%. Where it starts getting weird for me is the fact that they're also allocating another 35% to tips. 35% seems heavy, especially given that we know stocks are probably still the best inflation hedge over the long term. Again, this weighting is simply a product of the risk parity scheme. Tips might be great for a retiree, but then a retiree probably shouldn't have 70% in long-term bonds. Next, we have gold at about 10%. I've said it plenty of times elsewhere. I'm not a huge fan of gold. It has a long-term expected real return of zero. It doesn't seem to be a reliable inflation hedge, and it's taxed as a collectible. That said, gold does usually reduce volatility due to its usual uncorrelation to both stocks and bonds, and it does seem to hedge against uncertainty. Also, at least we're not talking about a huge 25% allocation like with the permanent portfolio. Again, the inclusion of gold is more appropriate for a retiree or someone with a short time horizon. We wouldn't expect any outsized returns from it. Then we have commodities. Well, not exactly. 
RPAR uses commodity producers, think energy companies, metal miners, etc., via the S&P Global Natural Resources Index, but I'm not even sure why. These are businesses involved in commodity production. As such, commodity producers are more correlated with the stock market than with commodities themselves, which sort of defeats the intended purpose of their inclusion. In holding them, the investor would also be taking on the business risks of these companies that may be unrelated to commodities. Lastly, commodity producers tend to sell commodity futures to hedge their price risk, which basically cancels out the precise hedge we're looking for. The choice of commodity producers could just be for the lower fee or for the greater expected returns compared to commodities per se. In either case, we wouldn't expect anything special out of them. In a nutshell, commodities have had negative real returns over the past century. Remember, we still always want our diversifiers to have positive future expected returns, and commodity producers don't even give us much of a diversification benefit with their positive positive correlation to equities and don't provide the economic protection we're looking for. So it's wasted space in my opinion. As with the case of the 712 portfolio that also used commodity producers, it appears to be a case of diversification for the sake of diversification. To be completely fair, once again, this is much less egregious if we're talking about a retiree's portfolio where we're looking to diversify to minimize volatility and risk. But it's still probably not the best way to go about achieving that goal. To put it succinctly, I guess my main point is this. If you're going to use commodities and tips, don't use risk parity weighting. And if you're going to use risk parity weighting, don't use commodities and tips. Sadly and ironically, I'd rather see RPAR ditch its risk parity roots in favor of a more realistic evidence-based view of asset performance and market behavior, and the likelihood thereof to weight different assets more strategically, though then it would have to change its ticker symbol. Even taking Dalio's retail all-weather portfolio from the Tony Robbins interview and packaging that as a single product would likely yield superior results over the long term, though admittedly that depends on the investor's goals. And while RPAR presents an affordable one fund solution for a diversified portfolio, I still don't know if that convenience is worth its fee of 0.50%. Remember, the fund is not doing anything particularly special other than the treasury futures for some leverage. Aside from that, it's holding a handful of very straightforward low cost index funds that any retail investor can buy and rebalance themselves for far cheaper. I'll explore this alternative a bit later on. Granted, it's obvious that many feel differently as the fund has amassed an impressive $1 billion in assets in a pretty short amount of time. If I had to guess, this is due to a combination of the pre-existing name recognition of terms like all weather and risk parity and perhaps an efficient solution for both novice investors who don't want to learn to do it themselves and for advisors who don't want to have to take the time to construct and rebalance portfolios for clients. In complete fairness to Evoke Eris, I love the idea of this type of solution, and I even think the fee is reasonable for it. I just wish the execution were a little different. The creators explicitly state that they expect RPAR's long-term return to be about the same as that of stocks. I just don't see how that could possibly happen, but all crystal balls are cloudy. RPAR should be available at any major broker if you want to buy it, but if you want to pay less than one-third of RPAR's fee and do it yourself, we can roughly replicate RPAR like this. 25% EDV, 25% LTPZ, 25% VT, 15% GNR, and 10% SGOL. I've got a link to invest in this portfolio in the description if you're interested. Ideally, one would hold this in a tax-advantaged account like an IRA and rebalance regularly. RPAR sounded cool at first until I actually looked under the hood. I disagree somewhat with some of the asset choices, but I disagree much more with their allocations. In fairness, no one picked those percentages. They're just a product of the unfortunate risk parity approach in this context. I think risk parity can be a useful framework, but not when we're dealing with assets like commodities and tips. I also don't think RPAR is worth its fee, as retail investors can pretty easily replicate it using most of the same exact low-cost index funds that RPAR itself uses. If I were interested in a strategy like this, I'd probably be more likely to use an alternative like a classic 60-40 or the Golden Butterfly portfolio. What do you think of RPAR? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.